Take a step back in time to your first playthrough of a Zelda game, or something similar. You're running around this seemingly endless world and the entire environment is working with you to paint a picture of Link's story. We all know that Link is essentially a silent main character, but there's something incredibly impressive and compelling about the world that surrounds him. It does a great job of showing and not telling in order to reveal the intricacies, depth, and lore of the game. But on the other side of the same coin, we're now seeing modern day movie-esque games take a completely different approach to the medium by layering their characters with emotion and depth through obvious methods like dialogue, as well as more subtle means that we'll get to as well. From the incredibly deep and complex modern characters like God of War's Kratos, or Ghost of Tsushima's Jin Sakai, all the way back to the classic characters in games like Mario, Link, and Ness, it's hard to believe that you haven't ever felt a personal connection to at least one of these icons before. Today we're going to take a look at the origins of both dynamic and silent protagonists, the purposes that they served, and how they can drastically impact your gaming experience. In my opinion, a few games stand out as perfect examples for these two opposing styles of storytelling. To me, modern Kratos is the pinnacle of a dynamic protagonist and we'll be mainly contrasting God of War with equally brilliant but very different franchises like Zelda, Earthbound, and a lot more. In the absolutely massive landscape of gaming by this point, dynamic protagonists play a pivotal role in shaping narratives that have really started to push the boundaries of traditional storytelling in gaming. From the early days of gaming with the classic arcade games like Donkey Kong, Pac-Man, and more, the main characters didn't ever, if rarely, speak, so it was up to the developers to use solely the mechanics and world in which the player played in to build out a story, and we'll explain the rationale and necessity for that soon. But unlike our classic silent protagonists, these modern characters are given a full-on, understandable personality, and we, the player, are basically companions who tag along with them for the story. We can watch them undergo significant changes as the story goes, and are given a look into their unique personalities and the significant developments that they make by overcoming all sorts of challenges, whether it's personal, internal, or physical. Now obviously there's a lot to unpack here, so I broke this down into four separate qualities and storytelling elements that I've seen make up a great dynamic character. Their personality and adding narrative depth, engaging dialogue to further world building, evoking player empathy, and a reflection of the player's choices. I've been playing God of War a lot lately, so at this moment, Kratos is freshest in my mind and has been most impactful on me lately. I'll also make some smaller references to other characters that I really appreciate, like Jin Sakai or Joel from The Last of Us, but if I were to analyze all these characters in full, I could write for hours. A good dynamic character is the focal point of an adventure, and throughout that adventure, it's incredibly important that the player gets to see growth, transformation, whether it's physical or internal, and a sort of self-discovery that's evoked from the experience of the character. This is crucial to offer the player a far more nuanced and emotionally relatable story. Kratos undergoes one of the most iconic character developments in gaming. For those who haven't played the series first, I will say, play it. But as some glossed over background information, Kratos was cursed by Ares, where he murdered his wife and daughter in a blind rage. When he snapped out of that rage, he realized what he had done and vowed to exact revenge on the gods. So in the earlier PS2 titles, he's portrayed as a vengeful and ruthless god, basically with nothing much more to him besides the fact that he's angry and he's on a quest for retribution. And the games reflected that at the time. In these games, there's much less emphasis on the story and Kratos as a person. Aside from some background lore, you don't hear much from him and the gameplay itself is much more arcadey with visual hit combo counts and much more hack and slash style fighting. It really nails the feeling of this blunt rage of the character. However, when the 2018 God of War was released, the writers took Kratos' character to all new levels and were given the opportunity to watch him evolve significantly. And by no means am I saying that the old God of War's elements aren't apparent in the newer installments of the series. There are many points where it gets super gory and violent, which is pretty awesome, but it just has a different feel because you can tell that the writers had a goal here to further emphasize the story through the gameplay rather than just kind of show a lot of rage coming from Kratos for the sake of, you know, violence and gory fun. The newer journey showcases Kratos grappling with his past, understanding his mistakes, feeling regrets, fears, and eventually love and understanding for his son Atreus. He seeks redemption, 
learns how to cope with his own humanity and his feelings of shortfall, and his character development is marked by introspection, growth, and a transformation that adds layers and layers of complexity to his personality. And between God of War 2018 and more recently Ragnarok, it's just 10 out of 10 character writing. And under the umbrella of the character writing comes extremely compelling dialogue as well as a powerful catalyst for future development. A great dynamic protagonist will engage in conversations that further the player's understanding of them. We watch as they navigate complex relationships or challenges, and we're given valuable insight deeper into their minds by hearing how they express their inner thoughts that we may not have known they were having otherwise. This kind of dialogue, in my opinion, boosts the story and propels it forward giving the player a deeper connection to the character and the world in which they're playing within as a whole. The dialogue in God of War plays a massive role in humanizing Kratos. He starts off the 2018 game as a cold, distant father who barely knows his son, and overall he comes off as kind of a dick. But early on we see that he wants to build a relationship with Atreus, but he doesn't know how to properly go about it. For example, when Atreus asks him early on what they're hunting, Kratos responds with this. What are we hunting? You are hunting deer. Which way? In the direction of deer. Okay. Uh. This way. Atreus eventually spots the deer, and rather than listen to Kratos, he acts on impulse. Kratos then begins to yell at Atreus. What are you doing? Now his guard is up! And then tries to take a step back and direct him a little more calmly. Holy fire. When I tell you to fire. Atreus then apologizes to Kratos, and Kratos responds with one of my favorite lines that I've ever heard in any game, movie, or TV show for that matter. I'm sorry. Do not be sorry. Be better. After deeply analyzing Kratos, it can be said that he gets so upset at Atreus' impulsiveness because he sees himself in his son. Atreus can sometimes act just as Kratos did, and has a hard time controlling his inner rage and impulsivity. And as the story continues, some of the most impactful moments are seen most notably in the periods in which Kratos and Atreus are just rowing around the Lake of Nine. The conversations between father and son not only serve to advance the game's plot, but they also reveal the inner struggles, conflicting emotions, and evolving relationships within this family dynamic. The nuanced dialogue allows players to witness Kratos in moments of vulnerability, showcasing a more relatable and multi-dimensional side to his character. Another incredible moment is actually unspoken. Kratos' body language in the games towards his son does a great job of showing without telling. Early in the game, during the hunting scene, we see Kratos extend his arm out behind Atreus after killing the deer, wanting to console him. But he restrains himself, showing the player that Kratos does in fact have a yearning to build and deepen his relationship with his son, but he's largely unable to do so at that point. But by the end of the game, we see the relationship between Kratos and Atreus grow when Kratos switches from constantly requiring Atreus to be better to agreeing that they both must be better. We will be the gods we choose to be, not those who have been. Who I was is not who you be. We must be better. A really cool tie-in is later in Ragnarok, we find out that Kratos actually learned this bit of advice from his late wife, Faye. We are not who we were. We must be better. And further, in Ragnarok, we actually see him acting as a better overall father figure to his son. And I think that this truly culminates in a heartfelt moment between Atreus and Kratos when Kratos apologizes to his son. Atreus. Sorry. Don't be sorry, Father. Be better. 
It's important for the player to become emotionally invested in a game, or really any other medium's story in order to create a memorable experience. It further amplifies the impact of the story and takes you deeper than just surface level gameplay. Again, back to Kratos, we effectively feel for him emotionally as the story goes on. On the surface, he's a brute man with immense strength and pretty much no one can physically resonate with him throughout his journey in this fantastical world. He's slaying monsters and fighting gods, but then as a human, he invokes a sense of emotional attachment from the player in a variety of ways. As I mentioned previously, we get to tap into his struggles, guilts, and regrets that he feels from his destructive nature in the franchise's past titles. This further humanizes him because I think that any human being can look at his character and begin to understand that he feels the weight of past mistakes and shortcomings, just like the rest of us. He fosters a sense of internal discovery and growth as we see through his relationships with both Atreus and Mimir as well. Most of the time throughout the games, Mimir gives off some solid comedic relief. But I think that him and Kratos are actually kind of best friends, and we see Kratos turn to Mimir more and more for advice on how to navigate complex relationships and situations. Mimir also will occasionally give Kratos great advice when it comes to his relationship with Atreus. Mimir is the self-proclaimed smartest man alive, and while he might be boasting, he does give some really valuable insight to Kratos as a person, because we see this guy who seems to be on the surface, a brutal killing machine, actually make himself vulnerable in his private talks with Mimir. What are you thinking, brother? I am thinking. I want things to be the way they were. Well, I'd like to climb a tree again. Certain ships have sailed. I just wish Atreus were not so restless. I care only for his safety. I know, brother. God of War is a series known for its mainly linear storytelling, so we don't have a direct impact on the outcome of that game. However, we are the person guiding Kratos through many impactful decisions, which influences our gameplay experience directly and allows us to shape the path Kratos takes within the confines of the main narrative. Another great example of this is in Ghost of Tsushima. If you haven't had a chance to play this yet, I'll spare you some of the finer details, but in your last fight after you win, you are given the choice to either spare your enemy or execute them. Although largely the same, there are still minor differences that arise depending on your choice. Lastly, the dynamic nature of a protagonist can serve as a great tool to maintain and enhance the player's engagement. A successful combination of the other three characteristics that I mentioned will align the player's and the protagonist's goals that will reach far beyond your desire to just reach the end of the game. This sense of investment makes it feel more like a partnership rather than you as a third-party bystander just navigating from checkpoint to checkpoint to complete the story. Dynamic protagonists' purpose extends far beyond the limit of traditional storytelling by giving the player a unique and tailored experience for their playthrough. My takeaways from a game like God of War or something like Ghost of Tsushima may be completely different from what you get out of the games, but overall, the characters are there to complement the player on their journey. You can resonate with the character by taking part in their adventures and really beginning to understand their stories and it's important to be on the journey with them as they overcome obstacles and watching them grow and develop from start to finish. We can learn a lot from some characters and hopefully adopt some of their more admirable qualities. Maybe, maybe not that one. A great dynamic character can directly influence our outlook on life in terms of how we view the world around us and how we treat others. Taking positive lessons from these characters can also have a positive impact on our decision making as well, as well as our relationship and community building with others. But what if we took that all away? Stripping a character of their voice and their body language, how can a game still serve an equally powerful experience? Silent protagonists are extremely common in games, and I think that video games might actually be the only medium in which this type of character works effectively. I did some research and didn't really come across anything substantial for this type of character in literature, and that honestly makes a lot of sense to me. How would you be able to get through a book that has limited to no internal and external dialogue? I don't know, but if you know of anything like this, please let me know in the comments because I'd love to look into it myself. Anyways, the appeal of the silent protagonist is for you, the player. 
You're able to create and make your own experiences with the game by putting yourself into the character's shoes. Since there's pretty much no dialogue from the character, you can visually create your experience and inject it with your own internal dialogue and choices that you make as you progress through the game. And as you already know, a lot of the most influential or iconic characters in video game history fall into this silent character category. Mario, Link, Samus, Ness, Chrono from Chrono Trigger, the list goes on. The first question that I want to answer is, why was this the norm for so long and what makes these characters fan favorites if on the surface they can be assumed to be generally pretty vanilla? And yes, I know Mario has a few catchphrases, so we know what his voice sounds like. And even as a nice little thank you to end Mario 64. Thank you so much for playing my game. But he's overall silent. The limited dialogue that he does offer is not pivotal to our understanding of his story or anything like that. So I'm going to count him as silent. As I mentioned earlier, the initial reasons for silent main characters were pretty obvious when you factor in logistics. Back in the late 70s and early 80s when video games were really starting to come into their own with classic arcade games like Donkey Kong, Space Invaders and more, we began to get acquainted with some of these series main characters. If you're a kid growing up in that time period playing these games, they're all extremely straightforward. Alright, I need you to jump over these barrels and climb these ladders and avoid these enemies and you win. Fair enough, makes sense. You could pretty much get the gist of what's needed, so adding lines of dialogue would just be unnecessary. In the original Mario games, for example, the world and game itself does a great job of showing versus explicitly telling you. Jump over the gaps, jump on top of things that look like enemies, get your power-ups, jump as high as you can on the end of level flags to rack up as many points as possible. So I guess first and foremost, for the goals that these early arcade type games were trying to achieve, there was really no need for characters to speak. It was a straightforward gameplay loop. Avoid the enemies, shoot the spaceships, save the princess, move on. Now, there are a few more reasons as to why it took us a while to get a protagonist that actually speaks. Mostly back then, protagonists were silent due to sheer utility. There was not a prevalence of voice acting, nor was there a budget to dish out money to give their main characters distinctive voices and personalities. On top of this, at the time, most games didn't have the storage capacities to store all these lines of dialogue. If you really wanted to build in some lore to a game, you could throw something onto the title screen or onto the game manual, but these aspects were largely ignored in actual gameplay. But at this point, games weren't ready to use voice acting to tell stories anyway. So whether it was to cut some corners on time it takes to get a game ready to go, or the budget, or the lack of access to talent, all these factors could have played a role in our silent characters in those days. The last reason that I came up with is because, well, if your protagonist never talks, then it's far less likely you'd grow to dislike them. One glaring example that comes to my mind is Bubsy, a really early example of a video game character whose uniqueness came from the addition of dialogue in between levels. What could possibly go wrong? Now, immediately from his voice alone, you're setting this guy up to polarize players. At the end of the day, for a simple platformer, this was just unnecessary and personally, I agree with people in that I find his voice kind of annoying. Sorry Bubsy fan club, my bad. So why introduce this dialogue at all if it opens the door for resentment? If you wanted to appeal to the lowest common denominator of this new gaming market, silent characters with an emphasis on the design of the characters themselves were the way to success. Let me know in the comments if there's any characters that you also cannot stand. Anyways, enough negativity. Just because a character doesn't speak doesn't make a game bad by any means, it just gives the player a different experience. In fact, this final reason is the most important of all, and what helps make some of my favorite games ever so iconic. When it comes down to it, I don't think I'd ever want Link, Ness, or a Pokemon protagonist to ever utter a single word. And here's why. Probably the most well-known of these silent protagonists that come to mind when the term is mentioned is Link from the Legend of Zelda series. Besides a few grunts and action noises here and there, we never actually hear him verbally speak in the 20 plus years of the franchise's existence. And we can just pretend that that deal with Phillips didn't exist. How about a kiss? There's a popular theory that Link doesn't speak because he's meant to be the quote-unquote Link between the player and the world. 
and he's written as a blank slate. But honestly, Miyamoto put this theory to bed when he said that the name Link actually comes from the original goal of him supposed to be the link between time periods as he's meant to travel between past and present and whatnot. But forget about what the creator of this character said himself. I got a B every year in high school English, and I'm here to tell you that there's actually something pretty powerful in that debunked fan theory. Rather than having you serve as a companion to Link like with Kratos, letting Link be a silent hero really shortens the distance between the player and the protagonist. Without Link's interjections and dialogue with regards to the experience, a lot of the interactions with the NPCs and the world itself rely on you to fill in the gaps. It really does sort of serve as a link between you and the world, and that is really the common theme between Link and the rest of the characters that I want to talk about. The way I see it, protagonists can be like a filter to the world that you're in. For lack of a better metaphor, I kind of like to imagine a silent protagonist like Link to be like like this prism thing from science class. On the surface, what you're holding is a boring, clear, you know, triangular shape. But because of its transparency and the way that it can bend light, it can actually serve to amplify everything around it and the light coming in. And that's kind of what I think silent protagonists can do for a game. It can further emphasize a game's excellent elements to the player. But going back to Zelda, what does this even mean? Even though we don't hear Link verbally speak, the player still understands his personality. He's a brave, silent hero who for the last 20 plus years has been saving and protecting his home of Hyrule. He builds relationships with others and you're able to progress the story with him, collect hearts to get stronger and explore a lot of the world. But you'll notice 10 minutes into a Zelda game that they put every ounce of love, quirkiness and creativity into everything else in the world. The NPC dialogue can be hilarious, the side quests can be heart wrenching, and the music will always, always build emotion, making you want to scale a treacherous mountain or make you want to reminisce on your youth. I'm going to try to keep my Ocarina of Time fanboying to a minimum, but I think there's something to be said about a game having the ability to make me as the player nostalgic for a time period in the video game. Mind you, I was sitting there at 11 years old. I didn't even know what nostalgia was yet. I was just looking around a desolate Hyrule as adult Link like, damn, where'd all the time go? Things used to be so great. But that feeling didn't need to be dumped on me with some emotional Link dialogue. In fact, I think that would have dampered the impact. It was presented to me with some of the most brilliant show don't tell storytelling in gaming. The reliance on music, omniance, and visuals created an experience that especially sticks with me today 13 years later. I think one of my favorite Zelda games is Link's Awakening for the Switch. I don't think that the prospect of Link not speaking impacts the story there either in any negative way. If anything, I think that it actually enhances the player's experience. You can take in the world visually and all of the elements that it has to offer, which is true of the newer games like Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom as well. You encounter many NPCs who have lively personalities and who give the player a deeper look into who Link really is and what he stands for. On top of this, this soundtrack too is absolutely fire. And honestly, every Zelda game, they're just all great, and I think this further helps the player kind of immerse into Link's world. So it's no surprise that Zelda's music and side characters really stick with us over the years, because the transparent prism that is Link is what really illuminates those often overlooked gameplay elements that that franchise just excels in. Another example, Pokemon which excels in building its expansive world and that sense of exploration and adventure. These are all most definitely magnified by the silent protagonist in the same way. Except unlike Zelda, I would argue that Pokemon connects you with the main character even more so, as the gameplay is really centered around the teams that you construct. In that sense, not only do you have freedom to dictate your own adventure through exploration, you can also personalize the main character to mirror your own self by building your team with your favorite Pokemon. Or alternatively, you can concoct a different personality by building the team around, say, a certain type. I've had Pokemon runs in the past where I would try to be like edgy and play the game with only dark and ghost type Pokemon, and then I would define that main protagonist in my head as this like edgy cool guy. But there's other examples too of silent protagonists allowing us to feel certain things by snipping that wall between the player and the playable. Earthbound, one of my favorite games of all time, is another really good example of this. This game manages to provide an intensely personal and emotional experience to the player. Unlike Zelda and Pokemon, instead of presenting the player with that metaphorical transparent prism, 
I would say that Earthbound almost reaches through the TV screen and molds the player themselves into that transparent prism. Now, I especially felt this during my playthrough, but keep in mind, I was kind of like Ness. I was a young kid growing up in American suburbia, growing more and more wary of the looming adult world that approached with time. But regardless of who you are, Earthbound will take you wherever it wants to go. From a familiar suburban town to this cold, horrifying, minimal halls of the past, you don't know where you're going to end up, and that line is so blurred between you and the silent cast of characters that you control that you're left feeling so connected to the emotional gravity of each moment. During both the light moments, the eerie psychedelic moments, and everything in between. This experience is elevated with some of the greatest music to ever grace a video game cartridge, coupled with witty dialogue, words of wisdom, and so much genuine heart that I still find myself looking for a game of the same caliber in that regard. By the time you beat Gigas and have the opportunity to roam the lands that you've already explored freely, you feel like you've lived five different lives. Undertale is sort of the culmination of everything that I've spoken about. It fuses that intense player to game connection inspired by Earthbound with that customization that comes with Pokemon, where you can literally go as far as turning your silent protagonist into either Gandhi or a psychotic mass murderer through your choices of mercy. And the world that Toby Fox built will then react accordingly to your choices. Anyways, I can go for hours into any one of these games, but the bottom line is that some things are better left unsaid so that we ourselves can fill in the gaps in any way that we or the game itself prefers us to see the world. Some may see these non-talking protagonists as indicative of laziness or even a remnant of an outdated age of gaming, but I would argue that these types of games are still more relevant than ever and rather than pointing at laziness, I think oftentimes it can just be seen as smart game development. Look at Elden Ring, a game with a silent protagonist, but with some of the most immersive world building from a recent game that I can remember. FromSoft put all of their efforts into the world, the gameplay, and the mechanics, and it shows. It's what a game like Elden Ring needs, and there's a reason why people regard it as a masterpiece. And these soul-type games in general, your character is obviously important to you. You have the ability to customize them to fit whatever build you might like, but in the grand scheme of things, the world itself is so overwhelmingly massive and expansive that your character is kind of a side element to the grandeur of the games and fights themselves and I think they complement the world that you drop into perfectly. This also works for comedic games as well. Some examples of non-verbal protagonists recently are the new kid in South Park games like The Stick of Truth and Fractured Butthole. <laughs> Fractured Butthole. The games themselves are super engaging RPGs with absolutely hilarious dialogue. You came for the South Park cast and the writing, so it makes sense to let those elements shine. This holds similar to a game like High on Life, where the world around the player is so comical and ridiculous, there's really no point to inject the personality of the player's character into it. This allows you to just experience the game and be a bystander to the hilarity of the world without having spoken dialogue in the game, and it works. There are so many games that I could get into here, and there are so many classics. But now, I'd like to pose this question to you. Do you have a preference for one style over the other? If so, why? I'm sure there's plenty other classic games that can be used as great examples of both character types, so if there's anything that really resonates with you, let me know in the comments below. There are games like Hollow Knight, Bioshock, and many, many more. And I was tempted to dive into Hades' unique use of dialogue, but that's a whole nother rabbit hole for another day. I really wanted to make this video to shed some light on the different styles of storytelling that are out there in games and show how much thought and care goes into both of these styles. As I get older, I reflect a lot on the games I played as a kid and the games I'm playing now. And through these new playthroughs, I realize that there are some beautiful lessons that can be learned through these various methods of storytelling. There are so many takeaways that can be made from either style, and I hope that both of these types of games can continue to be developed for us to enjoy. Also, if you've made it this far into the video, I want to thank you so much for watching. And if you liked this, please consider subscribing because I worked really hard and I need validation for my effort. Make my number go up, please. Thanks for watching.